Well, I am extremely honoured to be invited to talk to this broad and distinguished group of people, especially at this critical time, just before the UNFCCC meeting in Bourget. So thank you to the organisers and thank you to all of you for coming. Each of us ought to avoid emitting greenhouse gas. That's because we have a moral duty not to do harm to other people and particularly not to do it when it's for our own benefit. If you do cause the emission of greenhouse gas, it spreads around the world, it does harm, small amounts, to a lot of people all over the world, and this is harm that's done by you. Emitting greenhouse gas harms people, and therefore none of us uh, should do it. It's true that there are some exceptions to our moral duty not to harm other people. For example, it's morally permissible to harm somebody if it's in self-defense. And some people claim it's morally permissible if the harm is uh, very small, negligible. But it's not true that the harm we do by emitting greenhouse gas is small or trivial. Uh, it's true you only do a little bit of harm to each other person in the world, but because there's so many people in the world, the total harm you do is actually quite significant. I calculate that each of us, during the course of our lifetimes, will emit enough greenhouse gas to shorten people's lives in total around the world by around about half a year. Each of us would be responsible for reducing life in the world by about half a year, and that is certainly not a trivial uh, amount. So the harm of emitting greenhouse gas does not fall under the triviality exception, which permits you to do some, some harm, if there is such a thing, nor, so far as I can tell, does it fall under any of the other exceptions to the general duty not to do harm. So I think this duty does fall on us. We should not cause the emission of greenhouse gas. I recommend you to do it by, first of all, reducing your direct emissions as much as you can, and then by offsetting the emissions that you cannot uh, directly uh, eliminate. This is a duty of justice. Justice is a class of morality, and this one falls in that particular class. This means it's something that you owe to people as individuals. All the individuals that you harm by your emissions, you owe it to them uh, not to do it, and they have a right not to be harmed by your emissions. That's a duty of justice, but besides uh, that sort of moral duty, there's a second sort of moral duty, which is the duty not to promote goodness in the world, the duty that we often call uh, beneficence. You're under a general duty, if you can, to make the world a better place, or at any rate, make it not a worse place. And emitting, in emitting greenhouse gas, you are probably making it a worse place. Any benefits you get from it probably are outweighed by the harm that you do it. So you have a second sort of moral duty not to emit uh, greenhouse gas. This is a duty of beneficence. You might think that the duty of justice not to harm falls under the duty of beneficence, but actually it's not so. These are two separate moral duties, and I'll be talking more about them uh, later on. Sometimes they pull in op opposite directions. Sometimes it's, um, it's an injustice to do something, even though the effect of doing, doing it would be, in general, beneficial. It can be unjust to do something, even when your aim is to promote general good. The two duties can't count against each other. So I conclude that our emissions are immoral on those two counts. They're unjust and they violate the duty of beneficence. If we were all to act morally according to that principle, then we would not emit greenhouse gas and there would not be a problem of uh, climate change. So you could ask, is that the way we should promote the solution to climate change. Should we promote an increase in morality around the world so that people start attending to this moral duty of theirs? The answer to that is 
No. Maybe we should try and make people more virtuous than they are, but we shouldn't think of this as our means of controlling climate change, and the reason for that is simply that it would fail. According to the IPCC, if we're to have a reasonable chance of keeping climate change uh, within reasonable bounds, then there must be zero net emissions of greenhouse gas from everybody by the end of this century. So by the end of the century, everybody in the world would have to be moral if morality was going to solve this problem, and it, that isn't going to happen. We have no means even of reaching most of the people in the world, and certainly if we did reach them, we would not be able to persuade them of this moral duty. That's not the way to solve the problem. It's similarly immoral to drive very fast on the roads because you stand a risk of killing uh, people. But we don't rely on morality to make people drive slower on the roads. Why don't we do that? Well, it's because it wouldn't work. People are just, in practice, not moral enough. They're not enough influenced by morality. So instead, we employ the power of the state to compel people to drive more slowly. We employ, impose speed limits uh, and punish people who exceed them. And dealing with climate change is also going to require the power of the state to compel people to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gas. So that means in order to deal with the problem, we do need governments, or at any rate, high authorities, to take action. Again, we could ask for a moral response from them. Morality applies to nations just as much as to individuals. Just as there are moral reasons why individuals should reduce their emissions, there are moral reasons why nations should reduce those. So, for example, the United States government could come to the conclusion that it should not be allowing all these emissions from its uh, citizens, and it could use its coercive power by regulation and taxation to compel its citizens to reduce their uh, emissions. That would be a moral action on the part of the United States government. So we could ask the question again, should we respond to greenhouse gas emissions on a moral basis? Should we ask governments to act morally and ensure that emissions get reduced? That has actually been the main appeal of the UNFCCC for the last 25 years. It's making a moral appeal uh, to governments. Um, and it has had some effect. At this forthcoming meeting in, in Bourget, um, nations are being asked to present plans for reducing their emissions, and many of them have got plans. And indeed, some of them are implementing their plans. Why do they do that? Well, it has to be for moral reasons. It's not in the interest of any individual nation to reduce uh, its emissions because the emissions from any nation spread around the world and do harm to people around the world, not much of the harm falls back on the nation that does the uh, emissions. So by emitting, we get the citizens get energy, but the harm they do largely falls on other people. It's not therefore in the interest of a nation to reduce its emissions, but still it does it, or some of them do it to uh, some extent. That has to be for moral reasons, so far as I can see. I think countries do recognize there is some uh, morality. I don't think that nations are uh, entirely without uh, morality. They're encouraged to be moral by the actions of some of their citizens. And this is perhaps what we can most effectively do to try and solve the problem of climate change as individuals. It's to try and act through our governments to persuade them to become moral and thereby compel our compatriots to do the things that they uh, ought to be doing. So potentially, the morality of governments could solve the problem of climate change. However, I think it's pretty clear that that's not a realistic possibility. Maybe nations are responding morally to an extent, but the extent is really far too small. In the face of what has to be done, the existing efforts have been far too little, 
and the promises that are being brought to the COP meeting are far lower than they need to be in order to deal properly with uh, climate uh, change. 25 years of negotiation have achieved very, very little. Nations may be willing to ask their people for some sacrifices, but evidently not enough to make a big difference to the progress of climate change. Seeing this, I'm sorry to say I've come to adopt a rather cynical position. I don't think morality is going to help us in dealing with climate change. I think we need a different approach from the moral one. How can there be a different approach? It's commonly assumed that if we're to deal with the problem of climate change, the present generation is going to have to make a sacrifice. And of course, that would have to be a sacrifice for moral reasons. The current generation is going to have to make a sacrifice for the sake of uh, future generations. That means we need to carry a burden. And for a long time, the aim of the uh, UNFCCC negotiations was described as burden sharing, sharing out the burden among the, uh, among the nations. But actually, a very simple piece of economics shows that this assumption is mistaken. Greenhouse gas is what economists call an externality. When you're deciding what to do, whether to take a flight or buy a new uh, computer, um, what, what you do is almost inevitably going to cause some emission of greenhouse gas, and you balance up the cost of what you do against the benefit that will be derived uh, from doing it. But most of the cost of your emissions you do not bear yourself. It's a greenhouse gas that does harm to other people, and that harm is a large part of the cost of uh, what you do. And this is what's called an external cost, and you do not take account of it, generally, in your planning uh, of your actions. People who emit greenhouse gas generally ignore this external cost. That means that the result is, as economists put it, inefficient. The effect of having greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, because it's an externality, leads to this thing that is technically known in economics as inefficient. And what economists mean when they say it's inefficient is that it would be possible, at least in principle, to make a change that's better for some people and worse for nobody. This is something that economists call a Pareto improvement. Whenever there's an externality, or nearly whenever there's an externality, there's some exceptions, and I'll mention one in a moment. Whenever there's an externality, the result is inefficient, so it's possible to deal with that externality in a way that uh, improves life for some people, damages life for nobody. That is to say, it calls for no sacrifices. It would be possible to eliminate this inefficiency in a way that does not call for any sacrifice on the part of the present generation. Now, that comes as a surprise to most of the people I talk to. We're so used to thinking that the problem of climate change is the problem of trying to get people in the current generation to sacrifice something of their standard of living for the sake of future people, that many people are rather surprised to hear that that's not necessary. So I'm going to have to spend some time explaining in a bit more detail how this is possible. And to do this, I think it's quite helpful to think of an analogy. Think of, imagine there are two islands. The Windward Island and the Leeward Island. And the wind blows from the Windward Island to the Leeward Island. The Windward Islanders have some industry, factories, which make smog, and the wind blows the smog down to the Leeward Islanders, who suffer from the smog. This is a sort of analogy between the present generation and future generations. The Windward Islanders are like us, the Leeward Islanders are like future people, and the smog is like the greenhouse gas that we live, leave in the uh, atmosphere. Now, because the emission of smog in the case of the islands is an externality, it's inefficient. That's to say, it's possible to make a change 
that will be beneficial for some people and not harmful for any people. And in the case of the islands, you can see how. What could happen is that the Leeward Islanders could pay a fee to the Windward Islanders in exchange for their reducing the smog. If the fee is sufficiently low, the result will be beneficial for the Leeward Islanders, less smog, that they've paid a fee for that, but it's sufficiently low that they think it worthwhile. And because so far the Windward Islanders have not had any restraint on their emissions of smog, they would accept even a small fee, fee for the sake of their reducing their emissions to uh, some extent. They will be compensated by the fee that they receive for reducing their emissions, which they were doing, of course, because they gave them some benefit, but here is a, 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 a satisfactory fee to persuade them to reduce them. So there's a Pareto improvement. It's better for both sides. That's the analogy. Now, how would this work between generations in the case of greenhouse gas? I'm sure you've immediately seen a problem with the analogy. The improvement was made in the case of the islands by a fee being paid by the Leeward Islands, Islanders to the Windward Islanders. But future generations cannot pay us a fee for reducing our emissions. They have no way, since they don't even live yet, of paying us a fee to uh, reduce it. So how can this work? Well, we'll have to um, improve the analogy a little bit in order to make it slightly more accurate. Um, imagine now that the wind that blows from the Windward Island to the Leeward Island blows so strongly that the Leeward Islanders cannot send a fee up to the Windward Islanders because no boat can travel in the direction opposite to the wind. So they can't pay a fee. So they cannot compensate the Windward Islanders. And in that case, the, there cannot be a Pareto improvement. Without the fee, there couldn't be an improvement that's good for some people and not bad for anybody, which means that the situation is not, a, not inefficient. This is, the one, this is one exception to the rule that an externality causes inefficiency. There's still the externality. The Windward Islanders' smog is still hurting the Leeward Islanders, but it's not inefficient because the fee cannot be paid. But now we still haven't reached a good analogy with the generations, so I'm going to add a bit more. Suppose that, as well as sending smog down to the Leeward Islands, the Windward Islanders, also, Windward Islanders also send some nice things down to them. Every week they float down on the wind in a boat some nice presents. Maybe they think it's to help compensate for the smog that they're transmitting down there, or maybe not. Maybe they're just kind people. But at any rate, they make this transmission of good things regularly down to the Leeward Islanders. Now the situation is, is once more inefficient because there is a way in which the Windward Islanders can be compensated for reducing their emissions of smog. They can compensate themselves. They don't require the Leeward Islanders to send anything up to them. Instead, they just reduce the quantity of presents, nice things that they're sending down to the Leeward Islanders, keep that for themselves to enjoy, so that gives them a benefit and provided they make the quantities right, that benefit will make it worth their while to reduce their emissions of smog uh, to an extent. So we don't strictly need a fee paid by Leeward Islanders to Windward Islanders. The Windward Islanders can do the compensation out of their own uh, resources. Now, our intergenerational problem of climate change is like the analogy as we've now got it. Because we, the current generation, transmit nice things to our successors. Um, we leave them capital of one sort or another, artificial capital like infrastructure, uh, cities, um, farmland, uh, and so on. And 
we don't, it doesn't all die with us, it's left for future generations. And also we don't take out of the ground all of the natural resources that are in there. We leave some of them for the future generations. So we are transmitting gifts to future generations. We could have used those things for ourselves, but actually uh, we don't. So here is something that we could do. We could reduce our emissions of greenhouse gas, which other things being equal would have been a cost to us. We, we don't emit this gas for nothing. We emit it because we get a benefit from it. We, can, we uh, reduce our emissions, which would, other things being equal, be harmful to us. But we compensate for that by keeping some of the other nice things for ourselves rather than sending them on to uh, future generations. We leave the future generations fewer gifts. We re reduce the amount of artificial and natural resources of other sorts that we leave for them. Here's a way of looking at it that employs some economists' uh, terminology. As economists classify things, what gets produced in an economy, the total output of an economy, get divided into two components. There's consumption, what people consume in order to give themselves um, uh, a good life, and that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there is investment. These are the things that we use to promote productive ca capacity in the future. These are the things that we build, like uh, factories and uh, roads. So we split our total production into these two components. Now, here's something we could do. We could take the component, which is investment, which at the moment we're putting into machinery, ships, roads, and things like that, and switch that away from conventional investment, as I call it, to green investment. This is to say investment that actually improves the climate for the future. For example, insulating building, building windmills, and so on. So we can shift investment from conventional investment to green investment. And we could do that without reducing our own consumption at all. That's to say we could maintain the level of our consumption so we ourselves are not damaged by this, but we improve the lives of the future generations. We leave them less conventional investment, but they have a cleaner atmosphere uh, as a result. Of course, when we keep our total consumption constant, we will have to change the components of it. We'll have to switch away from the more carbon intensive components of consumption, but we could uh, we could do that. So that's a simple way of seeing how we could make this change which does not require a sacrifice for the present generation. It really is true that the present generation can make uh, this change. Uh, a sacrifice is really not required. We don't, therefore, need to ap appeal to anybody's morality. Dealing with climate change can bring a great benefit to the world by removing the externality, and this benefit can be distributed to the people in the world, to the future people, but also it can be distributed to us. There's a very big benefit to be had, and we are in control of its distribution between uh, generations. No generation needs suffer. So, there really is an opportunity for Pareto improvement. And I'll talk later about practical means of implementing it. But before that, there are some moral issues that I need uh, to talk about. It is true that a Pareto improvement is possible. But it doesn't follow from that that that's what we ought to do. Um, climate change does bad things to the world of various uh, different sorts. Two of the bad things are that it's a sort of injustice. I talked about injustice earlier on. And also, there is maldistribution in the world. The distribution of goods in the world is very far from uh, the best one, and climate change is contributing to that maldistribution. If we deal with climate change in the way that I've just described, by means of Pareto improvement that doesn't involve a sacrifice by the current generation, Neither of those bad things, neither the injustice nor the maldistribution, are being dealt with by what we do. And that might be an important objection 
to the proposal that I'm making that we should go for a Pareto improvement. So those, that's the question I want to address now. Was this Pareto improvement sufficiently bad in other moral ways that actually we should not uh, use it? So taking justice first. Suppose, this is to take a, another analogy, that you inflict injustice on someone else regularly. Perhaps you keep your neighbour from sleeping by making loud noise uh, very late at night, and you do it every night. Well, that's an injustice you're doing to your neighbour. Suppose, though, that your neighbour offers you a fee to stop doing it. And suppose you accept the fee. It's a good enough fee that you think it's worthwhile to reduce the noise that you make. And she thinks it's worth paying because the noise is so dreadful, she's quite happy to hand over the fee. So you're now both better off. You're better off. You're not allowed to make noise anymore, but you've got the fee and she's better off. She hasn't got the fee, but at least she hasn't got the noise uh, anymore. So it's a Pareto improvement. But it's clearly not dealt with the initial problem of injustice. You are harming her unjustly, and all this Pareto improvement has done is embody the injustice in the final result. It doesn't correct it. So there is why a Pareto improvement preserves or does not correct uh, what injustice there is. For the very same reason, the Pareto improvement in dealing with climate change doesn't correct injustice between people. From the beginning, I said that people's emissions of greenhouse gas do harm to other people, and that's unjust. The Pareto improvement involves a transfer from the people who are harmed by greenhouse gas to the ones who admit it in order to pay them to reduce their emissions. It may make both of them better off, but it does not correct the injustice. How bad is that? Well, the injustice caused by climate change is mainly between people who are contemporaries. For more than one reason, there is less of a problem of injustice between people of different generations. I can't give you all the reasons, but I'll mention just one. It can be revealed again by the uh, analogy. The gifts that the Windward Islanders send to the Leeward Islanders, to some extent, compensate the Leeward Islanders for the smog that the Windward Islanders are giving them. And that means they mitigate the injustice. Compensating somebody for an injustice you do her is a way of mitigating the injustice. Indeed, if the gifts were enough, they might fully mitigate, fully cancel out the injustice. Analogously, as I said, we are passing through our conventional investment gifts to future generations, which to some extent compensate them for the damage that we do through emissions of greenhouse gas. Common opinion among economists, at any rate, is that the world economy and national economies will continue to grow in the future despite the damage that's going to be done to them by greenhouse gas emissions, which means that future people on balance, taking account both of the Greenhouse gas we send them and the conventional investment we send them will on balance be better off, which certainly on the face of it means that the uh, conventional investment we send them more than compensates them for the greenhouse gas that they receive. They will be better off than us as a result of those two different sorts of transmission. So intergenerational injustice, I think, is not so much of a problem. Um, there will be, um, certainly, some uh, injustice uh, left. There will be a genuine intergenerational injustice if we implement a change of the sort that I've talked about. It will involve uh, gains to both the emitters of greenhouse gas and the people who suffer from the emission emitters of greenhouse gas. Both of those will be benefited by this change and already the emitters owe some compensation to the people who suffer from it for the harm that they've already done it, done by it. But there is a way of mitigating this change of injustice too by making sure that the great benefit that we receive by dealing with the problem of greenhouse gas is distributed 
to the people who have suffered most from it. When we distribute the benefits to the current generation that comes from reducing our emissions and compensating ourselves for it, most of those benefits should go to the people who have suffered the most from previous greenhouse gas emissions. And that is a way of mitigating. Indeed, I see no reason in principle why it shouldn't be enough to allow for full compensation of the people who have suffered uh, from their previous, um, from previous em uh, emissions. So that's injustice. The other problem I mentioned was maldistribution. Now, you might be a bit confused by that because the idea of maldistribution often is given the name of distributive injustice. So you might think it's a branch of uh, injustice. Um, but it's certainly distinct from the sort of injustice that I've been talking about uh, so far. You can see that by thinking about the, the Windward and Leeward Islands again. The Windward Islanders do an injustice to the Leeward Islanders by imposing smog on them. But they do not necessarily create a greater maldistribution as a result. Suppose that the Lewand Islanders are actually a lot better off than the Windward Islanders. The creation of smog does harm to the Lewand Islanders. It improves the conditions of the Windward Islanders because they're using what they produce. So it's actually increasing, inequality, increasing equality in the world. So this injustice, which the Windward Islanders are doing, is actually reducing the maldistribution uh, in the world. This is a case where justice and beneficence count against each other. You can think of maldistribution as a feature of the goodness of the world. And in this case I just described, the smog is actually improving the world in respect of that particular feature. So we need to separate justice from maldistribution. And maldistribution is, of course, a huge and hugely important feature of the world. Reducing the maldistribution in it would be a way of making the world much better, would greatly contribute to the goodness of the world. The duty to do that is a moral duty of beneficence rather than the duty of justice, at least as I've uh, described it. I said in the case of Windward Islanders, justice and beneficence count against each other. What about the question with climate change? What about climate change and maldistribution? Well, there are two sorts of maldistribution. There's first of all the present generation, uh, intergenerational, intragenerational maldistribution. The maldistribution there is between the contemporaneous inhabitants uh, of the world. Climate change is increasing that because by and large the emitters of greenhouse gas in the present world are better off than the people who suffer the uh, effects. So contemporaneous maldistribution is certainly being promoted by uh, climate change but on the other hand, it's not, climate change is not a major source of the maldistribution that we have. The main source of the world's maldistribution, in which some people are far, far worse off than others, is a long colonial history and two or three hundred years of extremely unequal economic development that's followed as a consequence uh, of that. The effects of climate change are too recent to have added very much to the maldistribution that there is uh, in the world. So we shouldn't think of climate change as a major contributor to present maldistribution. Things are different between generations. Common opinion, as I said, amongst economists is that we can expect future people still to be better off than we are. Our present economic activity, which benefits us and leaves greenhouse gas to future generations, is harming those future generations. So what it's doing is harming the people who are better off and benefiting us who are comparatively worse off. So it's probably increasing the level of equality between generations. <coughs> 
you might think, as a consequence of that, that it's actually reducing maldistribution uh, in the world. But that would not be correct, as a matter of fact, because in thinking about the best distribution, we have to take into account two factors. There's inequality between generations, but we also have to think about the total amount of good things which are produced by, economy, by economic, economies to benefit uh, the people. Investment is productive. That's to say, if you take some economic goods and don't consume them immediately, but instead invest them and use them to produce more goods in the future, they will produce more goods in the future than they would produce in the present. Delaying consumption is beneficial because it allows investment, which allows greater production in the future. That's how economic growth has been happening through investment in uh, capital goods. And that's a consideration that means it's a good idea to, uh, for future generations to be better off than us. It's good for the aggregate of well-being in the world for future generations to be better, than, better off than us. So if we, by our greenhouse gas emissions, prevent the transmission of economic productivity to the future, that is a bad thing for uh, distribution. If you weigh those two considerations against each other, equality between generations and the total production of the generations, the opinion of the economists who do the cost-benefit analysis of this is that actually it would be better for us to delay more production to the future. I put a picture on the screen, which I don't expect all of you to understand, but there may be some of you who understand it. This is a picture that economists will probably understand. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's there, and if you understand it, it may help you see what, what uh, I'm going to be talking about from now on. So, uh, damaging, um, so uh, emissions of greenhouse gas actually may do harm to the distribution between generations by increasing maldistribution, even though it increases equality. Whether or not it does that is uh, a, 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 um, a matter of balancing the two different considerations. Whether or not climate change as a whole increases maldistribution is another matter, and I think very difficult to think about, because it depends on what the distribution would be were there no climate change, which is an impossible um, counterfactual to evaluate. Still, Cost-benefit analysis done by these economists does suggest that we would do better to transmit some resources to the future. That's to say these economists think that we would do better not to bring about a Pareto improvement which is, present, which is good for both this generation and future generations, but instead take a small sacrifice on the part of the present generation in order to increase the well-being of future generations by an amount that would be much more than the sacrifice that they make. So their view is that green climate change, that, that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is better done by a sacrifice on the part of the current generation, even though that's absolute, not absolutely necessary. A greenhouse uh, Pareto improvement is possible, but according to these economists, it's not the best thing to be done. Instead, we should be making a small sacrifice. But just as that, that uh, harm we do to distribution can be mitigated by a proper distribution of the benefits of reducing emissions, so can just as the injustice can be improved by a proper distribution of benefits, so can maldistribution be improved. And a proper, di a proper distribution of the benefits can limit the harm we do to the distribution of goods by accepting a Pareto improvement. So I'm very much of the final opinion that a Pareto improvement is what 
she, we should go for. I do not think that these bad features of it are enough to make it worth rejecting the Pareto improvement. I think the failed, the history of failed negotiations in the, among nations has shown that we will not make any progress unless we change our approach to it. There are several major problems facing the world. One of them is climate change. Another is the maldistribution of well-being. And I think we should separate those in our thinking. Both of them are very hard to solve. If we continue to aim for the best result from climate change negotiations, we shall not solve either of them because the negotiations will simply fail. If climate change were largely responsible for maldistribution, it might be worth trying to solve it through climate change, through our response to climate change. But it's not. It's only partly, to a small degree, responsible for maldistribution. Climate change is a problem that requires very urgent solution. I think we should deal, we should fix climate change and also settle, settle uh, tackle maldistribution separately. Dealing with maldistribution requires a moral response from governments. Dealing with climate change does not. It can be done through a Pareto improvement which appeals only to self-interest and doesn't appeal to morality at all. I think if we recognize that and aim for a Pareto improvement, it'll make the negotiations at the UNFCC easier. It will not make them easy. There are still problems to be solved. And one of the big problems is that actually implementing a Pareto improvement is going to be very difficult. How can we possibly do it? What we have to do is shift investment from conventional investment to green investment, as I explained. Now, if we had a world socialist economy that controlled investment, it could simply do it. It could control the shift in investment. But we don't. We have a capitalist world economy, and the problem we're faced with is how to use the capitalist system to make the shift in investment. The fact that it could be done shows that this is not a problem of the real economy. This is a financial problem. This is a problem of the financial system that the world has. We need to use that in order to shift the investment. And let me say that in order to do it, the only way I can see that it can be done with the financial system that we have is by means of an increased level of indebtedness by the part of governments. Governments are going to have to issue debt, bonds, to the capitalists in order to borrow from those capitalists the money that they would otherwise put into conventional investment and use that money to promote green investment. So that is a way in which finances can be shift, shifted from conventional investment to green investment within the capitalist mechanism which involves uh, flows of finance. How can that be done? It's conventional wisdom these days that um, governments cannot take on more debt. That seems to me absolutely false. I see no reason why governments can't take on more debt. The, wisdom, the conventional wisdom is propagated in Europe, for example, in Britain, to take a particular example, at a time when it would be extremely easy for the British government to take on more debt. The British government at the moment is able to borrow at the rate of one half of 1%. So there would be no difficulty in accepting more, more debt. And indeed, the strong governments of the world can accept more debt. But a lot of the investment will have to take place where the weak governments are in charge, and they cannot borrow. So we need new a new financial institution, I'll call it a World Climate Bank, that is able to give enough backing to loans that it could allow even the weaker governments to borrow under the auspices of the World Climate Bank 
to finance the green investment that they need to, to do. I think that what these negotiators at the UNFCCC should be doing is trying to set up the institutional structure that will allow, allow a Pareto improvement to take place and mean that no longer do we have to appeal to the morality of governments, which is not enough. Thank you.